Right. Okay. So what's what's a quantum? We use the CPU form. And is it what's the problem with very short quantum? What happens if quantum is set very short? There'll be a lot of context switching. And what, what's wrong with a lot of context switching? <laughs> So it's low utilization of the CPU, CPU utilization. So if you keep switching the processes from, or the CPU from one process to the other, a lot, if you do that frequently, each time you do it, we call it context switching and the processor does not work. And therefore you get low CPU utilization. So if you have very short quantum, it will lead to low CPU utilization. Of course, it will lead to too many context switches, but that's what then that will lead to. Well, then what's, why don't we just go for very long quantum instead? What's the problem with long quantum? Any idea? No. Yeah, what's wrong with long quantum? Um, if the process keeps running, it's going to hold up the yeah. <clears throat> a long process will delay everybody. It will be like first come, first served without any interruptions. And what's a preemptive system? Any idea what a preemptive system is? You're going to be sitting here and do some other assignment or work. Where do I go do it somewhere else? Just sit here and kind of just be completely disconnected from the lecture. I don't mind if you don't know the material. That's why I'm asking questions. But if you're not here altogether, you're working on something else, that's not acceptable. You can go to the library, do your work. Have your attendance done and walk out of here. No problems. Okay, long quantum? No. What was the question? Long quantum? Preemptive systems. A, a system that allows a process to be interrupted, or they can, a, in a, a system where a process can be interrupted and the resource taken away from that process and allocated to someone else. What happens in systems where the CPU never leaves? A process never leaves the CPU. What solution can we have for that? What kind of algorithm would allow us to deal with processes that hold the CPU for a very long time? Any algorithm you're aware of? <coughs> There's an algorithm called round robin. That's the algorithm that uses the quantum. Round robin, the way it works, we set, for example, a certain length of time for a quantum and we give the CPU to each process. And then we go back again and re go around again and again, continually going around the processes that are there until some of them finish and go and more processes arrive, but you're continuously given the process to a different process, given the CPU to a different process, and recycling that operation. And the length of time you give it, a CPU to a process, has a maximum limit, and that's called the quantum. So long processes that hold the CPU for a long time will not be allowed in the round robin algorithm. What's the advantage of shortest job first? Okay. Yeah. 
low average turnaround time. It will be the average turnaround time will be shorter than any than any other technique. But sh shortest job first can be preemptive shortest job or non preemptive shortest job. Anybody knows the difference between them? What's the difference between preemptive shortest job or non preemptive shortest job? Yeah, you can interrupt the job and get to the short, uh, the new shortest one that got into the queue. Okay, so. Okay, in both systems, we give the CPU to the shortest job. Sometimes they call it sh shortest remaining time. But if another process comes in that has shorter time than the time remaining for this job that's now using the CPU, will actually interrupt the one that's running now. And for example, it still needs the CPU for five milliseconds. Another one comes in that needs CPU for two milliseconds. In non-preemptive, we never interrupt it. That's it. Once you got the CPU, you can run until you finish the time or you finish executing. But in preemptive systems, we stop a process that's running now if it has longer time than a, a process that just came in into the queue. And we give the shorter job a CPU. That's called preemptive. That means you actually stop a process that's probably running now if another one that's shorter than it comes in. Normally, we don't do that in non-preemptive. Non-preemptive, even if it's shortest job, we give the one, the CPU to the shortest job. So if you have a job five, seven, 10, we give it to the one with five. But if another one comes in immediately after this one started running, the five, another job comes in that needs CPU for two milliseconds, we don't interrupt the one that already has it. If it's non-preemptive shortest job first, it's easier to implement. The one that always counts how much have you done, how much you still have left, really it's very difficult to um, calculate all the time or know in advance how much time is left for each process. It's not an easy thing to do because you never know really how long the process will take on the CPU. Right, give me an example. A process is running on the CPU and executing and suddenly one moment after that it's not executing on the CPU anymore. Give me one good reason why would a process leave the running state. Any idea? It, it can need an input or output. So a process might be running and then says I need to read something. Then it leaves the CPU, we take it. And what, what state will it be moved to? The ready state? Or the, yeah, I we know. Is it the ready state or finishing state? Or the blocked state? Are you sure? Or waiting, yeah. So it's called blocked state. Or waiting state. Right, any other reason? Why a process might leave the CPU? Um, I'll come back to you. Think of one. If it commits an error, give me an example of an error. What kind of an error? I'll come back to you. Yeah. What kind of an error? The CPU might be kicked out of the CPU. A process might be removed off the CPU. If it tries one example of error, if it tries to access memory that belongs to another process or another or the operating system. No, think of another one. <laughs> Come back to you. Any other, re any other reason why a, a process might be removed off the CPU? If, it, if the process finishes normally, and it will be go. It will go where? Where will it go? To the ready state or the starting state? Initial state. We move it from the running state to another state. What state will it go to if, when it finishes? The finishing state. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any, any other reasons? No. I/O. Somebody said if a process needs I/O. And somebody said if there is an error, like uh, trying to access memory, 
and somebody said finishes normally. What else could cause it? Do you remember the diagram? I don't have it on. Yeah? If it exceeds the quantum, if the CPU holds on to the CPU, if the process stays in the CPU for a long time, longer than the quantum, then when the quantum is exceeded or reached, the system will interrupt it if we are running uh, preemptive systems. And where, what, what state will it go to from the running state? Back to the ready state, towards the back of the queue. Okay. Could you can you remind him another another reason why a process might leave the CPU? Yeah. Uh, I O quantum error by trying to access memory somewhere else or finish normally. Yeah. We need two more. Anybody can think of another reason? Yeah. Finish normally. Yeah, he said it. Yeah and finished up normally by terminating because they access the memory, the wrong memory. Any other reason, guys? If, if they commit another error, I'll give you a tip, it's another error. Logic error. Yeah, what kind of error? Like division by zero. Is that what you said? Yeah. If, if you ever your program divides by zero, then that's a terminating error. You'll also be terminated. So accessing wrong memory or running the wrong, you know, mathematical operation like division by zero. Or trying to open a file that's not opened, but not to try to use in your program and say, read this file. And before you read the file, you must open it first. If you don't, if you forget to open a file, you also get an error. These are normal logical errors. What else? Okay, there are about. All right, I think that's possibly all. So now what we're gonna talk about is the next manager. Now this is, it's called the process manager. Not the processor. The processor is the CPU. The process is, is the actual programs that are running. Um, but they also, it's referred to sometimes as, what is it? Parallel programming as well. So we will look at those. And management of the processes it means we're trying to solve the problems that are caused by multiple processes running simultaneously. So we have normally about 20 or 50 processes running. Of course, only one of them is running at any given moment of time. The code from one process only is executing. We only have one CPU and the CPU can only execute one process. Why? Because the CPU is a dedicated resource. Dedicated resource. Anybody knows what the, what's a dedicated resource and what's a shareable resource? Dedicated resources. So we focus on one thing, one area. That's a shareable resource. Okay. No. Okay. Anytime you're asked what what's something. Don't use the word, the name of that thing in your explanation, in your definition. If you ask what's a shareable device, don't say it's a device that can be shared. That doesn't mean anything. Um, so try to use different words. Any idea what a dedicated device is or a so shared device? It can be, can be used by a single user. A device that can only be used by one user. Mobile, yeah, one process. So oh, a printer can only be used by one user. No, no, one at a time. At a time. Don't forget the word at a time. So a printer can only be used by one process. When it finishes, another process can use it. When that finishes, another process can use it. But simultaneously, only one user can use it. 
We call that a dedicated device. They have another name for it. They call it mutual exclusive device. Mutual exclusive device, that means it can never be shared. Any users comes in, they have the full use of that device. Nobody else will, will be using that device until the first user has finished. So a device, a dedicated device, you can say it's a mutual device, mutually exclusive device. But it's better to say it's a device that can only be used by one user only at any given time. Don't forget at any given time, because a printer can be used by a hundred devices, but not simultaneously. It's important to put the word simultaneously or at the same time. What about a shareable device? Everyone, not necessarily everyone, be a little bit more specific. By more than one user. No. What's a shareable device? At the same time. Don't forget the word at the same time. In an exam, if you don't say it, your definition doesn't mean anything. You don't forget the word simultaneously. It's important, guys. I'm only saying now no and yes in a big way because I want you to remember. In the exam, if you are asked what's a shareable device, it's a device that can be used by more than one user simultaneously at the same time. That's a shareable device. A mutually exclusive device, a device can only be used by one user at, at any given time. Right, so that's one thing. Some devices are shareable, some devices are dedicated, mutually exclusive. If all devices are shareable, then we are never going to have problems. If, for example, like this room, it's shareable, we can all share it at the same time. Then anytime we need a room, we can walk into a room. Even if there are 30 other people, it's okay. We can sit down, do our work and leave. That's called the shareable device. And we never have to wait. We never have to have to go to sleep. The problem with computing and with all life, if you need a resource, you need to use something and it's not shareable, and you find somebody's using it, then what happens? You have to wait. That's a normal thing. There's nothing else you can do. You cannot share the same resource if it's dedicated resource. So once you wait, that's the start of a problem because you can have multiple resources. You have two or three resources. You need one more to finish work. You go for that resource, it's busy. So you go to sleep and you're holding the other two or three resources. And that process that has your resource and maybe another couple of resources then wants another resource, a third resource, and it's, it's busy. So that goes waiting. So I am waiting asleep on a waiting process that's also asleep. And that process is waiting on another process that's probably already asleep. And that process is probably waiting on me to get one of the other resources that I have. And there we have a, a circular wait. If we get to a point of circular wait, we call that a deadlock. The system is dead. Not the system, those processes that are involved in a circular wait, they are deadlocked. They will never ever come out of that situation. Because the only way to come out of that situation is if one of the processes finishes and they're all asleep and there's no chance of them finishing because each one of them is waiting on something that's with another sleepy process. So all the processes, they, they find themselves in something we call a deadlock, in a situation that they will never ever come out of. Unless, of course, we terminate one of them or terminate the whole system of switch. And often happens that you get a deadlock in your computer and Possibly, most likely, what you did is just you press the power button until you turn the top completely and you kill all the processes, those that are deadlocked and those that are not deadlocked. And what else is the problem with deadlocks is that they, it's not an error. You don't get an error. Nobody committed. Every process says, I need a printer. Oh, another process is using it, right? Hey, operating system, I'm going to go sleep. 
well, the operating system will actually knock you asleep until the printer is ready. So there's no error. You're waiting, legitimately waiting on a device, but that device unfortunately never comes back. So that's what we are gonna be looking at now for the next couple of hours. This situation that's known as deadlocks. If I can find the, the slides. Yes, where's the slides? Sharing. There it is. Sharing. There it is. Okay. I guess this is okay now, right? Does that, is that appearing on Moodle, on Zoom? Okay, so, no? Yeah, it's appear on the screen. Stop sharing and don't share the whole screen. Yeah. Is it appearing now? I've just shared the screen. Is it on the Zoom? Are you sure? Yeah? Okay, good. So, this is what we're going to be talking about, guys. It's going to be deadlocks. And a deadlock is a problem that can happen to a, group, a number of processes. One process alone will never go in a deadlock because a deadlock needs one process that's waiting on another process. So at least there'll be two processes in a deadlock. So if you have only one problem is running in the system and somebody tells you it's deadlocked, you can say no. You can never get deadlocked by just one process. It's like you're at home, you can use the TV, you can use the PlayStation, you can use the toilet, you can use any facility in the house. You're the only process in the house. So you are never going to get deadlocked because no one else is there to lock you up or, you know, you, you, to get involved in a, a deadlock. And also, so a deadlock can only happen to two or more processes, never one on its own. That's what an idea of a fact that you need to know. And it only happens if the resources are not shareable. Because if the resource is shareable, then there is no, you never have to wait. If the printer can print two sheets at the same time, then somebody's printing, you go and print as well, and you leave. No, you never have to wait. So if we don't have to wait, that means if the resources are not dedicated, if they are shareable, then we will never have a deadlock. So that's one of the problems. One, one of the causes of a deadlock is that the, the devices are mutually exclusive in the system. So anytime you start seeing dedicated devices start scratching around and say, oh, that can cause a deadlock. The reason, because if someone is using that resource, another one needs to use it, they have to go to sleep. They have to wait. And waiting is the start of a deadlock. Maybe it might evolve into a deadlock, maybe not. So. <clears throat> A deadlock can happen because a process like this one, like this car, wants to get into that space, but that space is used by another car. And that car, in order to leave this space, it needs to go into the next space, which is occupied by another car, and that car will not move there because there's another car in its way. And here we have four cars waiting on one another. And normally in a deadlock, that's it. But maybe in this situation, maybe this process can retreat, maybe. But in some other systems, it can retreat. If that car is there, then that's it. That's an absolute deadlock that they will never, ever come out of it under normal circumstances. A deadlock can happen in so many systems. And usually, it's by using resources. 
you always need more than one process, maybe 30 or 40, but even two can get that blocked. But one alone cannot get blocked. And then they need more resources that are dedicated. So these, can, these are examples of deadlocks, files. If a process, if you're running a program that's writing to a file and another process wants to write to the same file, that's not allowed. So you don't know about that, your process doesn't know, but the moment one is writing and your request comes in to write, your process puts to sleep until this one finishes. You don't see that, but that happens in the background. It, and it goes sleep for a few millions of a second or a few thousands of a second, maybe a second on the outside. So you probably never notice it, but if a deadlock happens, you'll notice it because they'll never come out of that. Your, pro your program will stop working. But waiting for a resource for a second or less or slightly more than a second, that's okay, that's normal. And it happens all the time. But the problem with it, if there's too many waitings, too many processes waiting, and they end up into a circular weight. It's absolutely important, this circular weight. As long as we don't have circular weight, there is no deadlock. If we have 30 processes asleep, all one is waiting on the other. The front one is printing or working. Sooner or later, it will finish. And when it will finish, it will release the resources. So the next one can work. And the next one can work. So we might have a long delay, but it's not a deadlock. The deadlock only happens if one is waiting on the next, on the next, on the next, on the next, and the one at the very front is waiting on the one the very first, or one in the back somewhere. So they, call, they form a circle. Once we have a circular weight, then that's a deadlock. So it can happen in group of files, in databases. All our programs will be reading and writing from databases. Sometimes some operating systems, they allow multiple users to read from a file simultaneously. So there's no problem. But writing, it's not allowed. And sometimes you can't write to a file. But in some other operating systems, more sophisticated operating system, you can say you can write to the same file, but not the same record. Somebody can be modifying record number 10 and someone else modifying record number 200. In some operating system, it's okay. But in some other systems, they say no. Once somebody is writing to a file, then you have to wait until they're finished. Also, other dedicated devices like printers, like other, you know, scanners, anything. You know, maybe communication lines, they are shareable. So it depends on the system. But most devices, if they are dedicated, then we can have a deadlock. So let's look at an example of a deadlock. If, you, if you're living in an apartment now, and there's a kitchen. This could be my kitchen, actually. I can recognize a lot of those stuff. So all these resources here are, are they shareable? Like can two people, for example, use this or use that? No, usually all this or you know, great that the cheese or whatever it is, all these devices are one user only. You can't share it. So if, if two people you need to use this, Somebody wants to bake a cake and somebody wants to bake a bread. Whoever gets there, get that machine to mix the dough or whatever it is, the other person has to wait until this guy finishes. The first user finishes using, right? So these are all the resources that are available. It's just like a computer system. We have printers, we have scanners, we have files, hard disks, tapes, all these devices, input and output devices. Now, let's fry an egg. Everybody knows how to fry an egg? No? It's simple, I'll explain it to you. You get a frying pan, hopefully non-stick frying pan, right? You heat it up, put it under, you know, some of the stove or whatever, the cooker, and break the egg in there. Of course, you need this spatula. They call this the spatula. Without the frying pan or the spatula, you will not be able to fry the egg. 
So these devices are not shareable. So this guy is cooking frying three eggs. When they finish, I can go in and use it as well, but not at the same time. So now there are two people living in this apartment and they both wake up in the morning and they both want to fry the egg. Why? They're happy, of course. They're, they're both gonna eat. And in the kitchen, we have lots of tools. We have a pan, a fork, a drainer, a spatula, every, all these tools that we saw earlier on. But you're only interested in two of those tools. What is it? The pan, the frying pan, and the spatula. Tool number one and number four. So they both walk into the kitchen at the same time. Their friends are there happy, but not for long. Because when they go in, they say, okay, what do I need? I need those two tools. This guy says, I need those two tools. So everybody walks in and grabs one of the tools. They walk into the kitchen at the same time. Somebody grabs the spatula, and this girl gets the frying pan. Now, this guy needs the frying pan. And when he lies, oh, it's busy. Somebody's using it. I, I sit and wait. So they cannot cook. They sit and wait. This one here has the frying pan, now needs a spatula. And can't find the spatula. So somebody else is using it. So what's the normal thing? Okay, wait, they'll finish. And I'll take it. But guess what? She will never finish because this guy never finishes. And this guy never finishes because they never got the frying pan because she has a frying pan and she never finished. And this is what we call a deadlock. They'll both starve. They will not have breakfast, they probably won't have dinner, and they'll probably die. And that's why they call this a deadlock. There's no way of getting out of this situation. Now, th there are a number of conditions. That's exactly what happens on a computer. Oh, I want you to remember the following. First, for this deadlock to happen, you must notice that these tools are not shareable. So we all agree, they are mutually exclusive, just like a printer on a computer. If you are printing a report and someone else wants to print, they cannot print until you're finished. So that printer is a dedicated device for mutually exclusive. Same with these. If we can manage to turn the printer into a shareable device, then we will not have a day back because nobody has to wait. If we can manage to have maybe two or three of these and they both can control each one of them at the same time. But it's not going to happen now. So that's the first condition. The tools are dedicated. So if you are asked, what are the conditions required for a deadlock? Don't forget the first one. If the resources are dedicated. Because if they are shareable, then there will be, there'll never be a deadlock. That's the first thing. The other thing is that these two guys, everybody gets a, a resource and is looking for another resource. The other resource is not available. So what do they do? They go waiting, sleep, holding the first resource. This holding business, holding <clears throat> and waiting, that's a dangerous situation. If you are allowed, if for example, they, they had agreement when they moved into that house, they said, guys, anybody wants to make cook some food? And they look and they get the tool, then they look for another one. If the other tool is not available, don't sit and hold the other tool that you have. Release the tool and go and come back again. Then, if that's the rule was applied, then this girl here has a frying pan, can't find the spatula. Okay, ah, I go and wait, but I better leave the frying pan. So now that guy finds the frying pan, use it, finish, leave the two tools, now she can work. So that's the second condition. First, if the devices are dedicated, and the second, if you are allowed to go in a waiting state while holding another resource. They call it hold and wait. If you are allowed to hold a resource and go in a sleep while holding that resource, then that's the second condition required for a deadlock. If we allow that, then hey, we are going towards our deadlock. <clears throat> The other system, <coughs> the, other, <coughs> the other condition that's absolutely required, this guy can never come by force and say, hey, preempt, take away the frying pan from a waiting 
you know, user. So if a user is sitting waiting with a frying pan, you cannot come and take the frying pan from the user. So that's, if we can, if we can do that, that's called preemptiveness. And then we will never have a deadlock. So if we allow in our system, either one user can forcibly take the resource from another user, or maybe the operating system, the manager, will say, hey, you, let me take that resource and give it to someone else. It's like I'm printing a report. Somebody else wants to print. I have to go and wait on something. I'm still holding the printer. If the operating system can say, no, sorry, you can't hold on to the printer. Let's take it away from you. That's called preemptive system. So if the operating system can preempt any resource and give it to another user, then there will be no deadlocks. But if the system is non-preemptive, then now we have those three conditions. If the resources are dedicated resources, mutually exclusive resources, and if you are allowed to have a resource, and if you need another one, you cannot have it, then you go waiting while holding the first resource, called hold and wait. If you are allowed to hold and wait, then that's the second step towards a deadlock. That's an important condition for deadlock. The third condition, there is no preemptiveness in this system. You can never take away a resource. In most operating and most computer systems, they are non preemptive. Like if you are printing, you start printing a letter, we cannot stop you and take the printer away from you and give it to someone else who will start printing on top of your report, then it's a waste of time. Or you're writing to a file and halfway we stop you, we get somebody else to start writing. It can ruin things. Overwrite stuff on file. So, in computer systems, most of these conditions are available. Resources are dedicated resources. Everybody who needs one resource and has it, and needs another one. If it's not available, they go waiting, sleeping, holding the first resource. That's called hold and wait. You need to remember those conditions. Mutually exclusive resources. Hold and wait. And no preemptiveness. You can never take the resource from anybody. The only condition left is if you end up in a circular weight. If you have a circular weight, then that you are in a deadlock. So these are the four conditions required for a deadlock. That's so important. So this is just an example, but whatever we said about this, it applies to computer systems. Okay. What's the first condition for a deadlock? Give me any condition, not not necessarily the first. Anybody? All resources are mutually exclusive resources. You can hold and wait. Hold one resource while waiting on another resource. Pardon? It's a non-preemptive system. If if the system is a non-preemptive system, that means. They'll never take away your resources when you are waiting. And the last condition is if we have a circular weight. So here's, here's what it is, and we'll be drawing diagrams later on. And the diagrams are simple. They only have three symbols. A circle, a square or a rectangle, a box, and an arrow. So these are the only three symbols. So diagrams are very quite simple. Now, a circle represents a user process. Only time you see a circle and diagram, and it's a process is running. Now, and every time you see a box or a square, it's a resource. It's a printer or a hard disk or a file or whatever input output device. And normally, normally it's not shareable. It's mutually exclusive. And then an arrow. Now. It's important, the arrow, to, where is it going from and where is it going to? If it's going from a process, like a user, if I'm pointing at a, for example, a PC, it's like, I want that, that's request. So if a process is pointing at a resource, it's requesting that resource, it says, I want that resource. It doesn't have it yet. It has not been allocated to it. So if you ask the operating system, can I have that printer? And this one says, can I have that file? And if the arrow is going from the resource to the 
user, that means that resource is allocated to this user. And that's the way we read it. When you read it, you look at the arrow. Start from the start of the arrow to the front of the arrow, where the arrow head is. So this arrow, the way we read it, we say resource number two is allocated to process number two. That means this printer is allocated to this user. And the way to read it from a process to a, a resource, if the arrow is going this way, you say this process is requesting this resource. It doesn't have the resource, but it needs that resource. And this is, imagine now these are the two users we had earlier who want to make the breakfast. And the two resources are the spatula and the frying pan. User number one comes in, grabs the spatula or the frying pan. Right, this, this user got the frying pan. Now it's pointing at the spatula. But this guy walked in first, took the spatula. So that one wants the spatula. Spatula is with this one, so this one goes to sleep holding the frying pan. This one has a spatula and it can see the frying pan, says I want that frying pan, it's requesting, but that frying pan is held by this process. It's allocated to that process. So this guy goes to sleep. So now we have two of them sleeping and waiting on one another for these resources that are dedicated. And we are not allowed to preempt any resource. And now we have a circular weight. So this is a devil. So this is a very simple deadlock. So if you are asked, maybe describe or give an example of a deadlock, there you are. Two resources and two users. They both need those resources. Resources are dedicated. You must, you know, you must indicate, if you are asked about a deadlock, that the resources are dedicated. And no preemptiveness. And these two users, one grab one resource, the other take the other resource. Now, each user now wants the other resource. So this one takes resource number one and wants number two. This user takes resource number two and wants number one. And they are in a circular way because both resources are busy with the other users. And that's what ends up. And this happens a lot in computer systems. There's another problem in computer systems. Concentrate on deadlock, but there is another situation, and it's called the race problem. The race, as in you know, running. Everybody wants to get there first, get the resource first. The race problem. That's what you talk about. To give you an example. <clears throat> imagine, imagine that you are in a bank. You have an account in a bank and you have a balance at the moment of 1,000 euro and 2,000 euro are coming up to you in two lots, 1,000 and 1,000. 1,000 is coming in cash and 1,000 is being landed into your account, lodged into your account by another check. So two amounts of money are coming. 1,000, 1,000, you already have already 1,000. So at the end, you should have 3,000 at the end, if everything goes normal. This is a problem they, say, they started seeing of, you know, in banks a few years ago. They've fixed it since then. <clears throat> but that's how it happens. Your bank, your record is a, in a file. So there's a, a database, there's a file with all the bank customers and your name is just one of those records. So the way to update a balance, if you are asked to write a program to update a balance, what you do is say, right, what's the balance now? And I want to add a thousand to it. So you ask the operating system, give, read me that record. What balance is now? Let's say you have 12,000 and you want to add 1,000. So they say, get me the old balance. <coughs> Let's say you got the old balance, 12,000. You say, add one to it, now I have 13,000. Write the new balance to the bank. So that's how we usually do to update any record in a file. You read first what's the value now, because you can't say, here's 10 euro added to the, to the file. Nobody's gonna do that process for you. So you, you ask, what's the balance now? It's 10. 
add one to it, now write 11 to the 5. That's the way it works. If you have to program it, that's the way you need to program it. Processing happens at the CPU. The file just either gives you the value you want or source the value you give it. It doesn't do any calculation at the file itself. So we have the file, one file is sitting there. Now, you walk in with a thousand euro into the bank and you go to the cashier. So the cashier has a process, a program running. I want to update your record. That's the cashier there wants to add 1,000 euro to your account. But at the same time, Griffith College has sent you 1,000 euros back. They said, hey, you paid too much. Here's 1,000 euro. Now, you have a check in your, well, no, they sent it to the bank. So that check arrived to the bank at the same time. So there's somebody sitting in the back room processing all the checks. And they happen to be doing, working in your account at the same time. You are working with the cashier, and that guy is working in the background, running a program that wants to update your record. So both of them, this guy have a check for a thousand, and here you have a cash for a thousand. You want to add them to your present balance of one thousand. So one thousand there, you add a thousand, another thousand, you should end up having three thousand. Now this is the way it works. So they're probably running the same program, the same process, but different copies of it. But let's say they're running two separate programs. They do the same job. So they both start running at the same time, executing their process. The, the program first says, give me the present balance. So a request goes to the operating system, can you read this file? And maybe within one millionth of a second of each other, they will read. They both read exactly 1,000. So this guy reads 1,000, send it back to, the, to your process. This guy reads 1,000, your process. They both read the correct balance up to this point. This guy says, oh, you know, we have a thousand. This guy doesn't know that one is running. So this guy says, oh, this guy is lodging one thousand. So one thousand plus a thousand. My our new balance is two thousand. Please write two thousand. This guy also got the previous balance, which is a thousand. Say, oh, we have a check for another thousand. So that's the old balance. Add to it 1,000 with 2,000. Write 2,000. So they both go to write. This one writes first 2,000. A few minutes of a second later, the other one comes in and writes 2,000 on your record. Overwrites that value. So now you end up with 2,000 instead of 3,000. So they call this the race problem because whoever gets there first or last will be printing the last value. Of course, it had to be fixed. And how did they fix it? They say, listen, if you come in to ask to update a record, even though you're only reading it now, but with the intention of updating, writing a new balance, let us know and put a lock on it. Tell us, lock this record. So whoever gets in there first and reads, this guy reads first, he'll put a, a lock on this record. A lock is just like a bit on or off. Like, like in studios, if they're recording over the door, you see a red lamp. That means don't go in, they're recording right now. That's the lock. When that line is, when the light switched off, you can walk in. So same here, they just put a light or, or just a flag, one or zero, to say this is locked. So this guy, whoever gets in there first, let's say this guy got first. So this guy puts a lock on this record. Now when this guy comes in to read, will not be allowed to read because there is a lock with the sleep. This guy reads, we send the one light, 1,000, the balance to this record. This guy says, fix it, write 2,000. And when they finish writing, they say, switch off the lock. Unlock that record. Now this guy is sleep waiting on the record. Now the balance is already changed to 2000. So this is unlocked. This guy waiting. What do you want? You want to read the balance? Read the now the new balance 2000. Send it back to its process 2000. Add the 1000 to it becomes 3000. So they use a locking mechanism. So anytime you want to do work, work on databases, you might have to resort to locking mechanism. The problem is that you might 
two copies of your program will run, or maybe another similar program will run and start working on the same file. And if sometimes it doesn't matter because you're not updating, you're just reading information, making a report, displaying information on the screen, it doesn't matter. You run it again, you get a more up-to-date information. But if you have the intention of updating, then you must stop anybody else from reading. Anybody else who has the intention of updating the record must be stopped until you read, update the record, and then release it. But again, because it's locked and the other one has to wait, it becomes a possibility of a deadlock. It goes into those resources that they cannot be shared. It's not mutually exclusive. Sometimes you might have to be locked out of using um, a file. <clears throat> so that's the race problem. You need to understand it. And the solution to it <clears throat> is done by locking. A deadlock can involve more than two processes. So far, we just looked at simple two processes. There can be more than two processes. So this, for example, I'm just looking at this one. This resource, the platter, is allocated to process three. Always, when you read these, you look at an arrow, start at the tail of the arrow first, read it. In this case, this one here, you'll read it like this, process three is requesting the tape drive. The tape drive is allocated to process one. Process one needs the printer, is requesting the printer. The printer is allocated to process two. As you can see here, they're in a circular weight, and therefore they are in a deadlock. Every one of them is waiting on the other. The other one is waiting as well. They'll never finish. They'll never come out because none of them will finish. Normally, <clears throat> if they went in a circle, let's say this one here, doesn't need this printer, it needs another printer or another device, and it's getting it, it'll finish. When it finishes, it will release this. When it releases this tape, well, the tape can be given to this process. When the process finishes, it will release the platter. The platter will be given to this one. So if there was no circular weight, they will finish. There might be a bit of a delay, but delay is not a deadlock. Sometimes there is another term called starvation. Starvation is waiting for a very, very long time, but still not a deadlock. That's like, for example, one process in a system can be starved, but never, ever one process in a system is deadlocked. Because you can never deadlock a process. One process alone in a system cannot, can never be deadlocked. It has to be with another one, at least, that they are blocking one another. They have to be in a circular way. And they call it the deadly embrace. So processes are hugging each other. There is kind of some kind of hold, but it's a deadly hold. One is holding a resource that's needed by the other. The other one is holding another resource that's needed by another. And they are in a circular weight. Now, we know how deadlock happens and what's needed for a deadlock to happen. Anybody remembers, anybody knows now what is required for a deadlock to take place? There are four conditions. One of them? Did you say non preemptive The system is an unpreemptive system. That means we never take away a resource of a process that even if it's waiting or sleeping or using it, will never take away that resource from a process. What's condition number two? If we have a circular weight. Normally the circular weight is the last thing, because if you have a circular weight, that's it, you are actually in a deadlock. But yeah, that's the second, and that's another condition. Give me another condition. If our resources are mutually exclusive, I mean, if they are shareable, then again, we'll never have a deadlock. And finally, the fourth condition. If in our system, you are allowed to hold this resource while waiting on another resource. You are allowed to hold the resources you already have. Okay, it's similar to non-preemptiveness, but this one, you are voluntarily allowed to hold them and you go to sleep while holding a resource. So if you are asked, 
What is required for a deadlock to happen? Remember, there are four conditions, and these are the four conditions. Now, how do we prevent a deadlock? How do we say we want to make sure we don't have a deadlock? Remember those four conditions, guys. The four of them are required. Not one of the four. No, the four of them must be in the system. The logical way to say it is say condition one and condition two and not or, it's the and. So the four of them must be, must exist in the system. Now, how do we make sure a deadlock never happens? Simple. Just take one of those conditions. If we can take at least one of them out, that means, for example, all our resources in the system are not dedicated. They are all shareable. We will never have a deadlock because nobody will have to wait. It doesn't matter whether you hold or you don't hold. It doesn't matter if it's preemptiveness. If we can remove this <clears throat> mutual exclusion, but of course it's difficult. Or if we can stop the hold and wait. If we can say, hey, if you have <clears throat> a resource and you need another one, the other one is busy, and you have to go to wait. Don't hold on to that resource, get rid of it. It's not easy to do <clears throat> because it may, systems may not work correctly. <clears throat> <clears throat> but we can manage it, we can manage these things. So first thing we're going to manage, we see at least an example. If you are asked, how can you make a system? How can you make the mutually exclusive devices shareable? Is that possible? It might say, is it possible that a device that normally by its nature is dedicated like a printer that can never be shared? How can we make it shareable? First, they said, is a new definition. So devices we know so far, a device is either dedicated, that's mutually exclusive, or shareable. Now we have another type of a device. A device that normally, normally by its nature, it's dedicated, but yet we manage to turn it into a shareable device. Even by trick or magic or whatever it is, we make that printer now suddenly can be shared by everybody. We call that a virtual device. So if you are asked, what's a virtual device? It's a device that normally it's dedicated, but we make it appear as if it's shareable. We make, we actually will share it. The word virtual, like virtual reality, that means it's almost reality, but it's not quite. Same with here. Virtual device, that means it's almost shareable, even though it's not really shareable in reality, but it, it will appear as if. So that's what virtual means. Virtual is almost, almost shareable. So how, how do we do it? So this is how they do that. They do that through something called spooling. Ever hear of spooling? Spooling is a method, a technique that's used in computer systems. It stands for simultaneous Printing or peripherals operation, simultaneous. Let's, let's just take the word printing, simultaneous printing operation online. That means we're going to be printing simultaneously, more than one process. Or simultaneous peripheral, peripheral I mean devices. So device is going to be used simultaneously online. How do we do that with printers? That's the way it's done. A printer is normally dedicated, only one device printer. But now what they do, between the printer and the process, between the process and the printer, before we send it to the operating system, the operating system check the printer is busy, it tells you no, sorry, you can't print. But now, instead, we have a small program called Spooler. Spooler is a function, one of those small little programs as part of the operating system. 
And what it does, it never says no to you. Remember, when you need to print something or read something, let's say you want to read from a file, from a hard disk, the printer has to stop, the CPU stops. Your program is running until it gets, says, read from a file. Then the CPU leaves you. You don't have the CPU. So we go in a sleeping state until we go and read the records for you. Anytime, guys, you want to do input, read, or write, you must leave the CPU. You must go sleep until the operation is done. The worst is always with the printer. Because first, the printer is very slow, very, very slow. Like, it takes maybe more than second or two to print a line. If you are printing a full page, it probably take uh, 10 seconds or 20 seconds, depending on how fast the printer is. So all that waiting just to print one page, <clears throat> and there might be four or five processes in front of me that want to print 200 pages, as you might end up waiting for 200 seconds. We cannot continue until you print. So now what, what we do with the spooler, the spooler says to you, yeah, you want to have a page to print on this printer, and the spooler knows that printer is busy now, but they say to me, yeah, I'll take that page, if put it in buffer in memory, I'll store it in memory, and say to you, it's printed, it's finished, we have it printed. So you go back to the CPU and start continuing, especially when it's on the print, in the memory, it's so fast. In many of them, seconds, take it from you, put it there and say, okay, it's done, printed. Remember, it's not really printed. We know, in reality, it has not been printed, but the user, the process doesn't know. Says, oh, great, you printed my page, or the back CPU comes back to you with another page. They give you another page, and you say, oh, it's done, printed. It's as if you have a magic printer. In fact, you know, the stuff is still there in memory, it's never been printed. And most of the time, the process would say, all right, I finished. I printed 20 pages. I finished. I printed my report. And terminates and goes. And we haven't even started actually physically printing its work. But it's there. We have it online in memory. As soon as that printer is free, we would send your print request. So the printer now looks like all processes can print simultaneously. They don't have to wait. So now all three or four processes can be sent <clears throat> to the printer immediately on the same time and the spooler says, yeah, you want a printer, put your stuff here. You want a printer, put your stuff here, it's printed. And they all think it's got to print. And of course, we'll keep our printers busy one after the other, they never stop working. As soon as we finish printing with this jump, we'll take this jump, we'll start sending them the next one. So our resources get busy, used, but we never delayed the CPU, and everybody thinks they are printing simultaneously. And that's how we turn a dedicated device into what seems to be a shareable device. To the, all the users, they think they are sharing, but in reality, it's not sharing, and that's why we call this a virtual device. So spooling is just one example of how a device can be turned into a shareable device. A dedicated device can be turned into a shareable device. And this way, we will never have a deadlock. If we can turn all our devices into shareable devices, then nobody will ever have to wait. See, these processes never have to wait. They come up and they say, I have something to print. We say, okay, but print it, go. So they never have to wait for another one. And therefore, there'll, there'll never be a deadlock. So that's one way of how to remove one of the conditions. So if you are asked in a question, in an exam, give an example of how a dedicated or mutually exclusive device can be turned into a shareable device, spooling is one very good example. Or if you are asked, how can you stop a deadlock from ever happening, you say, okay, by eliminating one of those conditions. If you are asked then for an example, this one is a good example. I'll give you another example of another dip for another the other condition, another condition. It's not there, is it? Doesn't matter. <clears throat> Think of it. <clears throat>
The other system is if, I'll go back to the previous one of the previous examples, I go back to this example here. Our first example, those two guys who go in and they, each one of them grab one of the resources and is waiting on the other. And of course, none of them will finish because none of them has all the, has all the resources they need to finish. So, and this is a definite example of a deadlock. Now, let's go back to this, the start of this system. See if we can have all our resources in our system in a list. Order, some, in some order. Doesn't, they don't have to be ordered in any way or any priority, but they're all in a list. And if we tell everybody, when you want, more than one resource, here's what you have to do. See this list? Get the one, the higher first, and then the next one in the list. Don't just randomly go and pick any resource. So see how will this solve the problem. The two users will come in. Yeah, they almost walked in at the same time, but even if, if there was tiny time between them when they walked in, Let's say this lady walked in first, immediately before this one, and she walked to that side, grabbed the, the frying pan. This guy walked immediately after the lady, but he saw the spatula and he went for it, and got it. And by the time they, both of them turned to go the other two, the other two is done. Now imagine if we tell them, sorry, you can't just go and get this, you know, the spatula or the frying pan. You must go in this order. Here's the list. You get whichever one, look at them, search for your tools, and get the one with the higher on the list first. You get them in this order according to this list. So in this case, when they both walk in, they both look at this list, and they can see there's a fork and a spatula. So they both, because they need the two tools, they must both go for the fork first. It's the first in the list that appears in the list of the tools they need. So they both must go for the fork first. Now, whoever gets that fork is the one who is going to continue. So, if, for example, whoever got the, well, no, not the fork, what are we talking about? A pan and a spatula. So, let's say the lady got the, the pan. The guy cannot go and get the spatula, he must get the pan first as well. So, whoever gets the pan, the other one has to wait for the pan. And therefore, this lady now can slowly goes and pick the spatula because it knows the other guy, the other user cannot go for the spatula first. So in that way, we stop a number of things. We stop definitely the stop and wait. Nobody's going to hold something and wait, but definitely also we stop the other, I don't know what the other position is, the fourth position. So we are never going to get ourselves into that situation, circular weight. We're never going to have a circular weight because we're never going to both weight, needing two resources and I have one and you have the other. We both have to reach for one. Whoever gets the first one, will have the second one available. The other user cannot go for the second resource. And therefore, this removes the circular weight from this system. We never have to have a circular way and that's another trick that is used in many systems that we will never have a deadlock so there are ways to remove those um, deadlocks by following certain policies so these are the conditions again just to remind you i was going to ask you to remind me but i'll remind you mutual exclusion Resource holding or hold and wait. Some books they call it hold and wait is a better term. It's easier to remember. You hold and you go into a wait. No preemption. If this system does not allow preemption, most systems will not allow preemption and the circular wait. You need to understand each system and be able to explain it. So anybody can explain one of the conditions? Name one condition and explain it to me. 
out of those four conditions required for a deadlock. And remember, if you're asked what's required for a deadlock, you must say the, those four conditions. Not to mention that uh, the situation where the uh, system can't stop the persons from using themselves. Okay, that's fine, but non preemption. Preemption is stopping, interrupting a, a process and take the resource away from it. Don't forget that part. That part is the preemption. So, a preemptive system, or a, you know, one of the conditions called non preemptive, it means in this system we are not allowed to interrupt a process because the process could be asleep anyway. You're not interrupting it but you cannot take away a resource from it, whether it's waiting or not waiting. Maybe sometimes it's sleep and has a resource. Can we take it away from it? No, in this system, non-preemptive, that means we're not allowed to take that resource from a process. You wanna give me a condition and explain it? Anybody? You wanna give me one of those conditions and explain it? Or I, well, I give you the condition. circular weight. What does, explain circular weight. So there could be 10 processes. Number one is waiting two, two and waiting three, three waiting 10. It's like the first one is waiting on the last one. Yeah, don't forget that. And the first one is waiting on the last one. Or well, yeah, waiting on a resource that the last one has. Yeah, that's the circularity. Anything else? It's called circular weight. They're waiting on each other. They're waiting on each other. They are, they are all asleep. They're all in a waiting state. None of them is really working. That's what we call a circular wait. They can't all be working and waiting on each other. If they're waiting, that means you're doing nothing. You're holding the other resources. All right, okay, and then hold and wait. That's if you need, if you have a resource with you and you need another one or more, of course. Yeah, sometimes you might have three or four, but you have one or more resources then you need one more that's not available. And you have to go waiting while holding those three resources. That's called hold and wait, or resource holding, whatever you call it. Okay, and you need to know, okay, and what does schooling stand for? Anybody remember? You don't have to remember. Some simultaneous printing operation. Some simultaneous peripheral or printing operation online spooling the last l is online o l spooling right okay and in fact spooling it will improve the use of the cpu because in the old days the cpu has to wait for the printer and the printer is so slow that the cpu utilization goes down you find about 20 or 30 processes they're all waiting on the CPU, and the CPU, they're waiting on the printer, and the CPU is not being used at all. There's nobody ready to continue. But with the spooling, it's mem main memory. You just put the stuff there, and you go back immediately to the CPU. So the CPU utilization is improved. So spooling, it does many things, but it actually it makes the printer that's normally dedicated appears like it's shareable. And what do we call a device that's normally dedicated, but we make, we, we share it? What do we call that device? Virtual device. Virtual device. So if you ask, what's a virtual device? It's a device that by its nature is dedicated, but we share it. We make it as if it's shareable. Right, okay. So now we have basically two topics covered. How does a deadlock happen? Which you can summarize it for us. How, do, how does a deadlock take place? Okay, if, we, if we are using a uh, dedicated resource. Okay, give me just the overall picture instead of going in detail. For each, like if multiple resource, uh, if multiple processors rely on, on resources that are being used by other processors that they are not being released. Okay. So it creates like a super group. Okay, thank you. But maybe then we might be able to um, take the resources away from those processes and then we will not have a deadlock. What does it take for a deadlock to happen? 
in a system. Anybody? Anybody wants to tell me? It's a non-preemptive system where one or more processes have one or more. Yeah, but maybe it's non-preemptive, but maybe the resources are not mutually exclusive. What does it take for an impact to happen? Anybody wants to tell me? No. Pardon? Uh, like all those four conditions like if we have all those four conditions, you said one, you mentioned one, but the four of them have to happen in a system in order for a deadlock to happen. So we know now what makes a deadlock take place if four conditions happen. And then if you are asked, you know, to mention the four or whatever, but deadlock needs four conditions. Now, how do we prevent a deadlock? How do we say, don't worry about it? Our system will never have a deadlock. How can you say that? I take one of the conditions required for a deadlock. So Wait, by taking the four of them out? No, taking one of them. By removing one of the, those four conditions from your system, at least one, but by removing one, you're, you're certain you are never going to have a deadlock. So for a deadlock to happen, you must have four conditions. To prevent a deadlock, if you are asked, how do you actually prevent a deadlock? to remove one of those four conditions. And then if you ask, how do you actually remove them? How do you, how do you get rid of mutual exclusion? Devices, then you give me the spooling example. It's a very good example. A printer is never shared, but we can make it shared. But don't forget, we call it virtual. We don't call it shareable device because it's not really shareable, still really at any given moment of time, it's only printing the job of one process, report from one process. But to the, out, to the users, they think they're, they're all printing simultaneously. They don't know in reality, we're not really printing. We just took their job, we finished their processing and they're gone. And we will do the processing later for them. Now, the next two things we need to do is how do you know when a process is in a deadlock? Because it's not easy, it's not, you can't just say, oh, if you have 50 jobs running or 60 jobs in a computer, some of them are like in a computer center downstairs in IT and there are few servers and few printers are ticking away and you know lines, communication lines are working and files are being updated on hard disks and all that. And out of the 60, like most of them will be waiting. Most of these processes will be waiting for a printing or reading a file or something. So it's very difficult to know of these waiting processes, remember there is no error. Deadlock does not give you an error. It's a normal operation. You want to print, but the printer is busy, you go to sleep. That's normal. The operating system will actually put you asleep. You want to file, and the file is busy, you go to sleep. That's the normal thing. Even if it's not busy, you go to sleep until we finish reading or printing, even if the printer is allocated to you. And we are printing, and you're going to wait. But someone else coming in, they have to wait. So the, the problem is that you, you will, it's so difficult to know if a process is deadlocked or not. Of course, one process, the other thing is that one process is never deadlocked on its own. Deadlock can never ever happen to one process. It happens to at least two or more. But remember there's one CPU out of these 60 processes, only one is actually executing at the moment. The rest of them are all waiting. Which of them are the waiting ones are deadlocked and which ones are not deadlocked? So this is what we will do. How, to, how do you actually identify a deadlock in a system? And in order to identify a deadlock in a system, they, they have enough programs running that always check in the system. But this is how they do it. Imagine if you are to do it manually, you'd be drawing the system. You'll be doing, um, what do they call this, the resource directed graph. They call this graph a resource directed graph. That means it shows show all the resources and you have pointers that direct you between the resource and the processes. This resource is given to this process allocated and this process is requesting that resource. So if we can draw that maybe we can tell if a process is waiting or is it deadlocked completely so first you need to just look how to draw it 
This is how to draw a resolution. There are only three symbols, so that's very easy to draw. And then, if I give you a list, you can make. For example, if I say to you, draw me, draw, pro, um, resource number one is allocated to process one. If I say, here's the resource one. Allocated, that means the arrow going from the resource to the process, and the process in a circle. Or, for example, resource process one is requesting a resource one, so the arrow has to go from the process to the resource. That's fairly quite simple to draw it, but it gets a little bit complicated. For example, I give you, if I give you this list to draw, right, process, process one, uh, process one is requesting and is being given allocated resource one. So well, there it is, the first one. Process one said, hey, I need that resource, and that resource is now allocated to process one. And then maybe process number one released the, the resource, the other one. Now, process number one was requesting it, now resource number two is allocated, oh, a different one. Resource two is allocated to process two, and so on. So you can draw it. Very quite simple. This is slightly, it gets a little bit now more complex. And this is actually a deadlock. For example, if we say resource one is allocated to process one, resource two allocated to process two. For example, these are three printers and they're being used by three, three programs or processes. But imagine if this process needs that resource as well, it needs two printers. Or if this is a file and that's a printer. Now I have the file, I need the printer. But the printer is on another process. So process one will have to wait until this one finishes. But it will finish. It might take a second or a millionth of a second or maybe five seconds or a minute or an hour. It will finish. Unless there is a reason to stop it from finishing. But for now there isn't. So we can request it. But imagine if we get to this situation, process one has this resource and it needs that resource. That's not available. Why? Because it's allocated to another process. So it has to go in a sleeping state. So it's waiting. And this one, is this one running? Yes, it has this resource and it's running, but now it needs this resource. That resource is not available. So it's allocated to another process. That means it has to wait for it. So this one is waiting, that one is waiting. This one has this resource, but it also needs this resource. But that resource is allocated to this one and it has to wait. So now all the processes are waiting and they're waiting on one another. And if you start with this one, if you follow the arrows from this, just follow the arrows from the process. And see if, it, if it brings you back to the same point, that means it's a circular wait. When we say circular, it doesn't mean just all of the circles. But as long as it brings you back to the same point. So if we follow this arrow, Starting at point process one, this brings us to resource two. It needs this resource two. Resource two is allocated to process two. Process two is requesting resource three. Resource three is allocated to process three. Process three is requesting resource one. Resource one is allocated to process one. Probably back to the same point. That's a circular way. That means there is a deadlock. So these, who is in a deadlock? We can even give the exact sequence. There it is. Process one, resource two, process two, resource three, process three, resource three, one, process one. This is the, same point. This is the cycle. This is the actual cycle of the deadlock. So if you are asked in a system, can you identify a deadlock? And you do identify, you have to tell us where. Because there'll be 20 processes. There'll be process five, process six, and all that. Don't mention them. Because we need to deal with those ones that are deadlocked. So you need to identify those. So, there's one, just another symbol, still a rectangle, but sometimes in the rectangle you get two dots or three dots or four dots. What does that mean? It's the only extra symbol. So we only have three symbols, a circle, an arrow, and a box. Now we have these little dots in a box. What does that mean? It means this resource, we have three entities of that resource. For example, this is a printer, then we have three identical printers. That's just what it means. It means we have three. That means we can have three users when using each of those resources. If we only had two, that means we have identical two devices that are not really dedicated, but we can have 
each user uses them. So if you have two or three printers, you can have them marked like this with two or three dots inside the box. But provided they are identical. For example, if one is a high definition printer and one is a normal standard, no, they are not identical. Or one is color printer and one is black and white, they would not be identical. Identical that means it doesn't make to you any difference whether we send your job to this one or that one. So they are exactly the same. So that's the only extra now thing in a diagram. So what I, I want you to look at some of these diagrams. And we're going to find out, where is this? Is this system is in a deadlock or not a deadlock? And this is how you do it. You start with one of the process. Let's say you look at a diagram, you say process one, two, three, start with number one. Doesn't matter where you start. See if you can get rid of all the arrows. If you can get rid of all the arrows, that means there is no deadlock. If you cannot, that means there is a deadlock. And assume one thing, if a process has everything it needs, remember a process like, for example, this process here, Q, process Q, there are three lines coming out of it. Now it's, it's either, it needs, it's gonna need three resources, either has them or doesn't have them. If the arrow is going away, that means, does that, what does this mean? What does this arrow mean from Q to C? That means process Q wants resource C. It's requesting it. If you are pointing at something, it's like I want that. That's what it means. So if the arrow is from the resource to the process, what does it mean? That means this resource is allocated to this process. It has it. So now looking at this process, it needs three resources. It has two of them. See, the arrows are coming in. It already has two of those resources. It only needs this. If that resource is available, let's give it to it. Let's turn it. You know, if it's available, if it's not allocated to someone else, let's allocate it to this process. And we say, once now the process has everything it needs, if it does, if it's possible to have everything, all the resources, then it will finish. Either in a millionth of a second or in 10 seconds, but it will finish sooner or later. So we can assume, say, okay, let's look into the future, it has finished, and we can wipe off those links. And if we can get rid of all the links, that means there is no deadlock. If some links are left, that means there is a deadlock. Okay. Let's look at, for example, process S. Is process S. Do you think process S will finish or not? Does it have everything it needs? Does it have anything? It has nothing. But it's pointing at B. It says, I want that. If I get that, I'll finish. It only needs one resource. So can we allocate resource B to the process? If it's not allocated to another process, we can give it to process C. But oh, unfortunately, B is given to process P. And we cannot give it to S. So S cannot finish for now. Let's go to process P. Does it have everything it needs? No, it, it needs three resources. It has two of them. See, these two are pointing at it. It has B and C, but it needs A. Can we give it A? No, A is given to Q. Ooh, that means it cannot finish. Let's go to Q. Can Q finish? It has this resource A, it has D, but it needs C, and we cannot give it to C because it's given to P. So actually, in fact, none of them have it. Can we find they are deadlocked? What's the sequence of a deadlock? Can you follow this sequence and tell me? Where, where do we go from here? Follow the arrow. Process P, it needs something. It needs A. So P to A. Where is A allocated to? Q. Q needs something. It has everything except one thing. C. And C brings you back to P. I brought you back to the same point, starting point, that's a deadlock. That means this system is deadlocked. And we, we can also specify which processes and which resources are deadlocked. Let's do it again. Okay. 
Let me go with this example. Now, I want you to take it, tell me. Now, just notice this. We have a resource here with three entities, and we have a resource here with two exact entities. So, start with each process. Start with process one, two, three. That's how you normally do. If you get a question like this in an exam, is this system in a deadlock or not? You want to see, can you, can you get rid of all these hours or can you not? Let's start with process number one. Talk to me through process number one. What does it have and what does it need? It has one instance of resource two and, and it needs resource one. Can we give it resource one? Exactly. No, we cannot allocate it because it's given to another process. Forget about this. This will not finish. Let's go back to, let's go to process two. Tell me about process two. Can process two finish? Tell me what it has and what it needs. And what it needs can be allocated to. It has process two and it has, uh, sorry, resource two and it has resource one. Okay, resource two, it has one of the instances of resource two. And it has resource one. It needs resource three. Can we give it resource three? Well, it's already allocated to another process. And, okay. Process two cannot finish. Okay, go to process three now. It has everything it needs. When a process has everything it needs, it will finish. When it finishes, we'll release, it will release all the resources it's holding. So the next statement you say, this is the way we go about it. Resource number, process number three has all the resources it needs. It has resource three. It will finish. And when it finished, it will release resource three. And if we are drawing the diagram, we can wipe this link. It's gone. Now, resource number three is available now. So, you as an operating system, this is what the operating system will do. We'll give resource three to, so resource three will be allocated to process two. Yeah? Don't that make any changes? To process two. So process two needs resource one, it has it. It has resource two. Now it has resource three. It has all the resources it needs. So what does that mean anything? It will finish. And when it finishes, does it mean anything? What happens when it finishes? It will release all these resources. So you need to remember those few words. It will allocate, and when it finishes, it will release. So it will release resource one, resource three, and resource two. So now two processes are finished. What about the last process? Number one. Resource one is free, it will be allocated to process one. Now, process number one has all the resources it needs. You need to kind of write that or say that. And if any process has all the resources it needs, it will finish. Or it will finish it to release the resources. When you release them, you can wipe them off. So in this system, all processes finish and all links are removed and there's no deadlock in this system. If you wanna go through this, tell me whether there is a deadlock or not in this system. If we cannot get rid of the links, all of them, that means there is a deadlock. Right, you always start with process one, process two, three, and you might have to go back. Once a process finished, you have to say it's finished, it releases all the resources it has and give them to the, sometimes you have a choice. A process will release a resource, you can, two other processes need it. Which one would you give it to? You give it to the one that will finish. You might give it to one who still need two more resources, it, it doesn't make any difference. So you give it to the one that will finish and release more resources. Go on, so you start. Okay. 
yeah. Just, just to point out that resource one, we have two entities of resource one, whatever it is. It can be file. We have two files or printers. We have two printers, and both of them are allocated. Yeah. So. Process to whatever you need, so it finishes off. Uh, yeah. If you knew that right at the beginning, when you start becoming a bit more comfortable with this, you can look and say, "Whoa, that process is finishing now." You might start with process two if you can quickly identify that it's finished. But go, okay, now we got to that point. Process number two has everything it needs. It will finish, and it will release resource one. So now resource one can be allocated to process one. Why would it finish? Because it has all the resources it needs. So you need to say that. So process one has all the resources it needs, it needs, and it will finish. And when it finishes, what does it do? What does the system do? Release the, the, the resources it's holding. So it will re release the process, resource one and resource two. So that's gone. That's gone. So this entity of resource two is allocated to process three. And then process three has everything needs it finishes up process And then process four is also will finish. So there is no deadlock in this situation. All processes finished or all links are removed, and therefore there is no deadlock. Anybody wants to take a system? The next one? Anybody? I can see the hands up one at a time, guys. One at a time, please. Ah, go on, go on. No. Well, you, you weren't following us? Okay. You want to go or you want to go? At the end, yeah, go on. Uh, Start with process one, if you, if you don't know which one is best. Um, process one, the process for resource one. Well, it has a resource to allocate it to Recent. Sorry, process one has resource uh, in two, two, but it needs resource one. Oh. Can we give it resource one? That's the way you should okay. tell it. The logic should go. Oh, we can't give it resource one because resource one is allocated to process two. Yeah, now, okay, then we forget about process one. Let's go now to process two. Okay, process two has. Well, request one and two allocated to it, but it needs to request three, so it can't finish. Okay. Um, resource three, if process three is allocated, sorry. Yes, it has. It has resource three, but it needs resource two, so. And it cannot have it, right? Yes. Because none of them would finish at this stage. So there is a deadlock. Yes. <clears throat> Sometimes there are two deadlocks in a system. So give me the sequence of a deadlock. Start at process, any deadlocked process. Start at process one. Follow it and when you get back to process one, that's your sequence. Just name the process of the resource. Yeah, yeah, you just follow the arrows that bring you back to the same process, and that will give you the actual sequence. So, process one, resource one, process two, you can go this way, resource three, process three, resource two, process one. That brings you to the same point. That means these are the ones we mentioned, are the ones that are deadlocked. Process number one is Right, resource one, process two, there, these two are deadlocked in that one, and this one, and that one are deadlocked over that, and this one and that one are deadlocked over that. We got back to the same spot, and that means this system is deadlocked. And that's something, that's a question that always appears in, in exams. You're shown this diagram and say, is there a deadlock here? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. If there is, please give me the sequence of the deadlock. 
Want to have a go, one of you guys? Go on. But speak up a little bit loud. I can't hear you. Go on. So, okay, I'm okay. Say it again. Process number one. Yeah, and it is resource number two. Can we allocate it to it? No, well then leave process number one. Go to the next one. That's how you go about it, the logical way. You start with one of the processes. Can you give it, can you get it moving? No, go to the next process. If you go through the entire system, you can't move any process. That means there is a deadlock, start looking for the sequence. Go to process two. Can we allocate resource one to it? No. We know why, because it's allocated to another process. Right, go to the next one. And process, why would it finish? Because it has all it needs, it will finish. Okay, it only needs one resource and it has it. Go so until finish. Yeah, and then when it finished, what happened? What happens? The, the resource is released. Right. Who can we give the resource to? Anytime you release a resource, think, can you give it to another process? Pardon? We can give it to process one. Yeah, okay. So what happens when we give resource two to process one? It, it gets all the resources it needs. It has all the resources it needs because it, it needs two resources, it has this one, and now we will give it this one. So now it has all the resources it needs. What happens to it? And then it will release this resource and that resource. Then what happens? So we, as a system, allocate that resource one to process two. Yeah? Go on. What happens to process two when it has now resource number one? Yeah. Okay. So it has all the resources it needs. It will finish and to release the resources. And all resources are finished. And there is there a deadlock? No. Thank you. Anybody wants to take this or we had enough? Okay, make it quick, go on. Process one has a resource that's allocated resource one, needs resource three. Process two has resource one, needs three, process three, process three, process four, process five has everything it needs, so it can finish up and release the resource. Okay. This can this resource yeah, th four allocate. can be allocated to process three. Process three has everything it needs to work in the result. It will release it one resource three. four and three. Three is allocated. Two has everything it needs to finish the result. It releases everything in resource two goes to process one. Has everything it releases goes to process one. Okay, so um, uh, they all finish. Okay. An exam like this is an easy question, so make sure you understand it. And make sure you write the statements. You might at the end say, hey, there's no deadlock in this system. You get a mark for that. How did you know that? That's what I need to hear from you. You know, well, I read from you that you went through those steps, the logical steps to say, how did you actually release them? <laughs> so this is how, a pro how we know there is a deadlock in the system or there isn't. Sometimes not all the processes, some of them will finish and some of them will not finish. You need to identify the ones that will not finish, that are in a deadlock. Okay. What's one of you? Did you have a go? Uh, uh, process one has been allocated resource three already, and it can finish because it only needs one. Yeah. And uh, process two has already been allocated one of them, but is waiting on. So what are you going to do with this that we got? It's three now. 
It's free. Anybody looking for it? Process three. Can can we give it to process three? And three, yeah. And they all finish, and there is no deadlock. Thank you. Okay, right. I leave you to go through the rest of those. So every diagram I found, I just put it in there for you to practice it later on. So let's go back. So now. We know how a deadlock happens, how we can prevent it completely, but sometimes we cannot prevent it. So at least we need to know when it happens. Now we know how it can, we can identify it. And then we'll work out if it happens and we identify it, then how do we actually get rid of it? But first, how does a deadlock happen? Thank you. Oh. How does a deadlock happen? How do we get a deadlock in a system? Uh, thank you, thank you, yes. How do we get a deadlock in a system? How do we get a deadlock in a system? Thank you. How do we get a deadlock in a system? If we have four conditions that are required in the system, if I ask you what they are, then you start, you know, identifying them or naming them or whatever. Or if you wish then to name them later. But initially, tell me, in order for a deadlock to happen, there are four conditions that they must be, all of them, the four of them are in the system. Don't start telling me, oh, it's where you release on there and then circle away, and then you forget the other two, you don't mention them. That's not a full answer. Full answer is that in order for a deadlock to happen, we must have four conditions. If you say that, you're almost there with the full mark. Okay, it's good to name them then later on. But if you start naming them and you name only two of them, then you really miss the point. That's that will never have a deadlock. Now, how do we prevent a deadlock from ever happening? How can we be relaxed? We say to you, don't worry, we're never gonna have a deadlock in our system. You know how? by removing at least one of those conditions, making sure one of those conditions does not exist. How can we turn, how can we get rid of a dedicated device from our system? Any idea? How can we get rid of the dedicated or mutual exclusive condition? By? Spooling is just an example. What's the idea in it? Yeah, by turning that device into a virtual device. That means turning it from absolute dedicated device into what appears to be a shareable device. And we call that virtual device. The virtual device is the solution. I say to you, give me an example of that. Spooling is a perfect example, right? How can we get rid of the circular weight of a system? How can we remove the circular weight condition? These are the kind of questions you're gonna get guys in the exam to show that you understand the system. There are two kinds of questions normally in exams, in all exams. A question is that you give me the list of these things. If you have learned it, you put them down. The questions that test you for understanding. You really know how it works or not, you know? That's the kind of questions that if you understand it, you'd be able to answer it, even if you didn't really hear the question before. Okay, how do we get rid of the circular weight condition? How can we make sure we never have a circular weight in our system? Any idea? in a particular order. Yeah, by putting, arranging all our resources in our system in one list and make a policy. Anybody who needs a few resources, make sure you take them in an order as they appear in the list. That way, if two processes need two resources, whoever gets the first one can continue and get the second one. They don't get locked. They don't lock each other out. Whoever gets the first resource 
can proceed to the second resource. The one who doesn't get the first resource have to wait. And it's better to have only one of them waiting, better than having a, a deadlock. Okay, that's good. We're almost there. So we know a deadlock can happen. We know how it happens in a system. We know how to identify it and how to prevent it completely. But in reality, we can never really prevent deadlocks completely. So we get to another situation where we say, let's avoid them. We can't get rid of them, but let's do our best not to fall into them. But we are with the possibility that they might happen. But let's keep identifying them. And if we see one is about to happen, we better not step into that situation. And we, we keep on avoiding them. So how do we do that? And this is how we do that. The overall picture. And then we get into the details. Our system, you can imagine our system is in either of three states. Either a state of an absolute safe system that we know we're not gonna, we're nowhere near a deadlock. Or in a situation that, hey, we are getting a little bit closer to a deadlock. We are in an unsafe situation. We're not in a deadlock, but we're not too far off it either. If we can recognize that, we can avoid it. We can move away if we can. But the third situation, if we are right back into the deadlock, we're stuck. We can't get rid of that. Right. So this is the kind of system. There's one system that they call the banker's algorithm. So if you are asked, how do we avoid deadlocks? Not how do we prevent a deadlock? Many students, you ask them the question, how do you avoid a deadlock? They say, ah, oh, remove one of the four conditions. That's the wrong answer. That's how you actually prevent a deadlock. So there's prevention, that means it will never happen. To prevent a deadlock, move, remove one of those conditions of the system. But we can't remove them, then it's possible we have a deadlock so we go to something else we call, we call it deadlock avoidance so there's deadlock avoidance and the deadlock prevention you need to know the difference between them now banker's algorithm is used to avoid a deadlock how does it work now with banker's algorithm somebody came up with it Mr. Dijkstra, he's a computer scientist, he came up with many algorithms. One of them is known as the banker's algorithm. He said banks seem to do well, but they used to. They always have money and people always needed money and they came, took loans from them. They done their business and paid back the loan and the bank was great using the money as the resource and the people as customers. How did they do it? And he started looking at banks. How do they actually give loans and they work so successful? Unfortunately, in Ireland, in the year 2010, they were, banks were so good. And we had the meltdown, the collapse of the financial situation. But back in Holland at that time, that's where Mr. Dijkstra was, he thought banks were absolutely brilliant. So he looked at the way they work and they came up with the idea. He said, customers come into the bank and they ask for loan. No single customer will ask for more money than the bank has. For example, the bank has a million. No customer can come and say, give me two million because we know we can't give you. So that's the maximum for every customer. But also, the bank can give 10 million in loans to 10 different, you know, to lots of customers. But you know, the, the, in every time, the bank doesn't give the full money. If you come up, we say, I want half a million. We say, okay, we have approved you for half a million. But what are you going to do? We're going to build the house. Okay, here's the first 10,000 is to, build, to maybe dig the foundation. Come back to us when you have it done. We don't want to give you a million and you disappear. We want to see what you're doing with them. Let's say you want to build a factory. Right, you want to build it, you want to get the equipment, you want to train staff. They're going to need money on three, three allotments. So first you need money to build, here's 100,000. You need equipment, here's another 100,000. Now we saw the bank is built, the equipment is there. Now you bring in staff, here's your last 100,000. 
Now you finish, you start paying back. You only pay back when you, when you finish your project. Same with computers. If a computer needs two files and a printer, and we give you the two files and the printer, you'll, you will only release them when you finish completion. And with banks, then when you start paying back, then we start giving the other customers that we've already ap approved them for loans. So these are the general ideas. And they say a system is in a safe state, the bank is safe if it can give if it can give all the customers that it has, even though we only have a million and we've given 10 million, approved 10 million so loans. We can't give 10 million, of course. We only have 1 million to play with, but we give it to this customer, this customer pays us back. Then we give it to this customer, this customer pays us back. We give it to this customer so we can actually pay 10 million, but not at the same time, one at a time. So imagine this. Imagine we have three customers here. This customer has asked for 4,000. We approved it. This one, 5,000. This one, 8,000. So the total loans are, I don't know, what? 13, it's 18 altogether. And we don't even have that much money. We only have 10,000. But remember, no customer, we can never say to a customer, we we'll give you more than what we have. But the total to all the customers would be a lot more than what the bank has. But we don't give them all at the same time. Now, this guy has taken nothing out of the four. We have given nothing yet to this customer. This customer asked for 5,000. We've given them 2,000 so far. He's already taken 2,000. How much still? They still needs to come back and ask for 3,000. This guy still needs to come back and ask for 4,000. What about this one here? This guy has asked for a total of eight. We've already given them four in the past, so we can come back tomorrow and ask for four. So this is how much they still need to take. The last column, remaining credit to customers to, to take their loans. Now we've already, this is how much we've already paid to customers. We paid two and four, six out of 10. That means we in the bank, we all still only have 4,000. Now, in this moment of time, are we in a safe situation or not? This is the question. Is this bank in a safe situation or not? And the, that's the question. And the answer is simple. If we can give all the rest of the customers all the money they need with what we have, then the bank is in a safe state and we're not in a deadlock situation. They're not in trouble. The trouble, if we cannot satisfy all the customers. Imagine the customer, not necessarily at the same time. So how do we test it? We come up and say, all right, how much money do we have? We have 4,000 in the bank. We look at this column. If this column is not given to you, you have to make it up. You have to make you say, okay, this guy wants 4,000, we gave him nothing. That means he still owes us, you know, we, we owe him 4,000. This guy has asked for 5,000. We've already given him 2,000. still, Right tomorrow, say, can I have the rest of my money? 3,000. So that column is important. How much remaining credits required by customer? Now remember, we have four. Can we satisfy them all? You pick the smallest one. Right, there's this customer here, customer number two. We can satisfy that guy. We have 4,000. This guy needs three. Imagine he comes and we say, here's your three. We still have 1,000 in the bank. We give them the three. This guy will finish. He's got everything that they need. Like he built a factory, he got the machines, he started making bicycles, he started selling them. Now he's going to pay us back. How much is he going to pay us back? 5,000. Because we've already given him two before, we just gave him three now. So next month or the following month or three months from now, he'll start paying us back. He'll pay us back five. We already had one. With the five, now we have six. Can we pay someone else? Yeah, we can go to that guy. Say, out of six, he's four. We still have two in the bank. So this guy will finish, build the bank, or, you know, maybe this guy is buying a shop or something, or buying something and selling it, and he'll give us back the loan. So now we still have six. We can give that guy four out of the six. We have two left. This guy will finish, he'll pay us back eight. Eight with the two, we have ten. 
So, yes, if all, all these customers come into us tomorrow or one day at a time, we can actually pay them all. So our bank in this situation now is in a safe state. That's how you check, is the system in a safe state or unsafe state? So if, if for example, we're in this position, Now this is a safe. Let's say we're in this situation, we're safe, and one customer comes up and says, let's say this customer comes up and says, can I have 3,000? Would we give them 3,000 or not? So just pretend we gave them the 3,000. So that means this guy is already now uh, has seven out of the eight, so only down to 1,000. And we still have 1,000 in the cash. In the, in the safe in the bank. So this will the table will change. This is one thousand three and four. Then we have one thousand. Can we satisfy everybody? Yeah, we can start with the third one. We cannot satisfy those two with one thousand. But if this guy, if we gave them, you know, three more thousand, right? And we still have one thousand, and that's all he's is gonna need, we can pay the one thousand, we pay us back eight, we can satisfy the three, and then satisfy the four. So, yeah, we will approve that request. Is this bank, is this situation, is the bank in a safe state? Can, the, this is the answer to the question. Can we satisfy all the demands no. for all the customers? Okay, what we total we paid to the customers is 9,000. Out of 10, we only have 1,000. Then we satisfy it in the first one. We can't satisfy this guy or that guy or that guy. No, the situation is bad. We're in a deadlock situation. So that's how we judge. Are we in a safe state or unsafe state? So by instead of banks and loans, we look at resources and process requirements and process allocations. Let's just think of these as printers. For example, we have, I don't know, we have a few printers, we have 10 printers, and we have a few programs that started running. And this program says they need four printers, five printers, eight printers. We only have 10. But yeah, no process should ask more for more than what we have. And they started running. This process didn't even ask for its printer yet. This process has already asked for two, still might ask for three. They could be files, maybe not printers. And so is, is our system safe or not? We only have, we have four printers left. Yeah. If this one comes in and say, give me four, we can give them the four and then they'll return them. We gain nothing. And then we can also give this one four and this will give us back eight. And then we can help this. And finish. But usually we start with the smallest one. Start with the smallest one process. If, but we can satisfy them all. On the assumption, we are assuming if a process, if this process gets the other three printers, it will finish. Sooner or later it will finish. So if a process has everything it needs, it will finish. Whether it's after a second or after a minute. But they will finish sooner or later. And when they finish, we can take the resources, they release the resources, we can use them to satisfy others. Even if the others have to wait, let them wait, but it's not a deadlock. Okay, there's a difference between a deadlock and a long wait. Long wait is okay. As long as we know that process has everything it needs, it's going to finish. Sooner or later it will finish. We know it's just a matter of time before it will finish, and we give it to the other one. So how do we do it? You get a question like this in an exam. You're, you're told there, there's a process, uh, there, there are three processes that we've already given them those resources. This one has three printers. Let's just work on printers, but it could be any resources. And it needs nine all together. So it still needs six more. This one 
needs four altogether. It has two and still needs two more. This one needs seven altogether, has already given two. It needs five. Are we in a safe state or not? Is this system in a safe state? We need to know. Okay, there's a piece of information missing. We need to know how many are how many are available in the system. Let's say this system has already three, two, and two. That's seven. I don't know how many we have. Let's say we have ten. Let's say we have obviously if we have approved nine, then we must have at least nine or more. Let's say we have ten devices in this system. We have ten printers. Is the system in a safe state or not? We have 10 printers. This guy needs nine, but already has three, it needs six more. This guy has two, it needs two more. Total it needs is four. This guy needs seven. We gave it already two and still needs five. So total of printers given, three and two is five and two is seven. We have 10 all together. We still have three with us. Is this system in a safe state or not? It is in a safe state. Why? How can you satisfy? The question is, can you satisfy all these processes, A, B, and C? You'll have to work out how much more do they need? How many printers do they need? This guy needs nine all together. It already has three. How many more does it need? Six. Right? This guy needs four. We've already given it two. How many more printers does it need? Two more. And this one needs seven. It already has two. Still needs five. So in fact, you should make another column. What more do they need to get? What extra credit? Now, we have 10 all together. We need to work out how many do we have in our hands right now, available, free. If we have 10, we've already given three, two and two, that's seven. So we have actually three devices with us. Can we satisfy all those customers? Any idea? This one needs six before it finishes. It already has three, needs nine altogether, so it needs six more. We can satisfy Customer A. What about customer B? Customer B needs four altogether. We've already given it two. It needs two more. Yeah, we have three left. So if we give two to B, then it will finish. And when it finishes, it will come back with the four. It will give us back all four printers that it has. With the one we have, that's five now. We have five. What about the last one? The last one. It needs seven, we've already given it two, it needs five more. Yeah, now we can satisfy C. So we can satisfy B first and then C. But that one needs six, we don't have six, so that's right. But after C finishes, it will give us back the seven. Now we can give the six to this one and it will finish as well. So the system is in a safe state. And you need to remember the safe sequence. So the safe sequence, we have to first satisfy B. Remember, we only have three left. We give B first, because B only needs two. You have to work out here the column, how much is left for each process. So B needs two. Yeah, we have three, we can satisfy B, finish. B will take the two, but we'll bring four. So we have three, we give two to B, one is left. B will bring back four, but now we have five. Now we have five, this guy needs six, this guy needs five. We can satisfy now C. We give C five, it brings us back the seven. This guy needs six. We give it six, it bring us back the nine. And we can satisfy the processes in this order. B followed by C followed by A. You understand the, the, the idea, guys? First, you need to work out what column does A. There's a column missing that you should actually draw it beside this table. 
if it's not already there? How much is left for each customer, for each process? This one has the maximum, it needs nine. It already has three. It needs six more. Can we satisfy it with what we have? We only have three. We can't satisfy it. We go to the check the next process and all that. Is that clear? Okay. This talks about exactly what I was saying. So this is, if you need to go through it one step at a time, there it is. Allocate two to B. So first we start by giving B two. So it will finish and to release all that it, it will return them. Then we can check C, satisfy C, get C5 from them, and it will return. Now it has seven. We can finish and release them all. So now we can satisfy the last one. Or we should draw here another column with how much, how many more resources do you need just to make it a little bit clearer. So this is called the banker's algorithm. You could be given a problem like this and you say a situation like this and you say is this system safe in a safe state or not or is there a deadlock so all you have to do maybe is to make it easier draw another column if it's not already there right here how much does each process need okay and this one is missing that we have a total of 10 so a total of 10, how much do we have now? We've already given three, two, and two, that's seven. We have three in our system, three available. Can we satisfy all these customers? Not one, all of them. But you have to pick which one do you satisfy. The ones, start with the one that needs less. So this is known as the banker's algorithm. And the banker's algorithm is only used not to prevent deadlock. It doesn't prevent it. It avoids it. So every time a process comes, let's say this process comes and say, can I have the rest six resources? Say, no, I have to wait. We can't give them to you. If we give them to you now, we'll be in a deadlock. We can only give this process. We only have three. If this process comes and say, give me two, we can't give it to you. If this process comes and say, hey, give me, you know, it needs five, and we only have three. If we say, give me three, we can't, if we give a three, that's it, we're finished. If you will not finish and give us anything back, our system will be deadlocked. Will, our system will go to an unsafe state. But if this process comes and say, give me two resources, we give it the last the two resources. But we know then it has everything it needs and it will give them back to us. And you, you kind of generate something like that or write it. Sometimes you create a table and write the information or draw like the diagram earlier on, it's easier than talking, but it's up to you. So plan it correctly or... So this is known as the banker's algorithm. You should be able, maybe, if you're asked to describe or explain the banker's algorithm. Basically a way of knowing with what you have left of resources, can you satisfy all the customers, all the demands, all the requests, but it's just which one you satisfy first is important. You always start with the smallest one. If you can't even satisfy the smallest one, then the system is not in a safe state. That request is not good. Banker's algorithm doesn't work, it works. You keep avoiding. Like if a customer comes up and say, give me five resources, customer seven, you say, no, if I give, we give them to you, we'll be, we'll be locked down, we'll be, putting our system into an unsafe state. We don't want to do that. So it works, but it's not really the best system. Banker's algorithm is not the best system. Why? Because it takes into consideration all the customers and their maximum requirement. It says, I better have enough to satisfy that customer, that customer, that customer. It's not really, you know, it's not very efficient. Also, it does, it works by asking everybody at the start, you better tell us how many files do you need and how many printers you need. You have to declare your requirements at the start. And we say, okay, this customer needs three printers. Here are three printers, I put them aside for that customer. This customer needs five. So 
really it's it's it takes the worst situation of a requirement and if the number of processes change in the system and the requirements change you have to do it again and recalculate so it's not a dynamic kind of system that readjusts itself if one of the customers terminates we have to hey stop recalculate again how many customers do we have what resources do they have so it's not really one of the best systems jobs must state and we ask every program to declare at the start the number of resources they need so we can make you know we know how many resources we have and we need to know all the customers what each one of them needs at the start the number of total resources for each class must remain constant like if we change if we take one of the printers out of our system it will ruin our calculation we bring another printer it will we have to recalculate again and the number of jobs must remain fixed as well if another job comes in we better start recalculating or if a job finishes then we re need so there's a lot of processing and it needs to be done every time there's a change overhead costs incurred can be quite high so the cost can be high resources aren't well utilized because you say i'll keep those resources just in case that process comes in in fact processes some processes they only need the printer in the last second of their operation but we hold it just in case that process comes in so it, it's like it's not very very efficient and poor utilization of resources. So now we talked about avoidance, we talked about detection. How do we detect whether there is a deadlock or not? How do we know if there is a deadlock in a system or not? Anybody? Anybody remembers? Okay. How do we prevent a deadlock completely from a system? by removing one of those one at least one of those conditions from the system that's prevention how do we avoid a deadlock anybody deadlock avoidance how do we avoid a deadlock banker's algorithm is one algorithm that's used to avoid a deadlock it doesn't prevent it but try to avoid it. every time it recognizes the system is getting in a dangerous state we better not give a resource to this process Let's keep the resources. Maybe another process, better giving it to another process that will finish. The last topic is the easiest as well. <laughs> so we looked how deadlocks happen, how to prevent them, how to, to avoid them, how to detect them. Like, we knew there is a deadlock. We have 30 processes running, the five of them are deadlocked. The other 25 are running smooth and nice. But we recognize those five are asleep. They're not getting out of that sleep. How do we recover? How do we get out of a deadlock? Well, those processes that are in a deadlock, they never ever come out of a deadlock. They're stuck in a deadlock situation. Without outside interference, there will be no you know, ending. They'll stay there forever. Because every one of them is asleep. There's nothing gonna wake them up, except when one of them releases a resource. So the only way, guys, to get rid of them, and probably some of you have done it, your system got a little bit frozen, so that's a deadlocked. You just went for the power button and switched it off and rebooted. What you did, you terminated all processes. Those that are deadlocked and those that are not deadlocked. And that's the worst situation. That's the highest cost you have by restarting the system, terminating all processes, those that are involved in the deadlock and those that are not. And remember, when you kill a process, terminate a process, it can be very costly. It can cause a lot of errors. Let's say I was running a program 
and giving everybody 10% extra marks, for example, right? You got 40, I'm giving you 44. You got 60, I'm giving you 10%, 66. You got 80, I'm giving you 88. And just before I finished, somebody terminated my process. Maybe I was deadlocked, maybe I was not, but somebody terminated my process. Now, I run it again. I've already given the guy 40, given 44. Now I'm going to give him 10% extra. So I go, now my calculation has gone completely wrong. A guy that was 80, I give him 88. Now 10% of 88, so I'm going to give him another, an extra 8.8 per mark. So if, if you, that's okay to do it to students, we give you more marks. But to do it in a bank, to pay more money to more people, or, you know, that can be dangerous. They don't want that. So, that killing a process can be a problem, can cause a big problem. Especially if that process, writing to files. If it comes back and write again to a file, it could write wrong information. So, killing processes is not a good idea. But there's no alternative. We have to kill processes. So now, what's better than switching off the system completely is to identify the processes that are deadlocked. Let's say we have 25 processes in the system. 25 of them are not deadlocked, only five of them. We identify them, let's kill only those five. So we kill the five processes that are deadlocked. That's the next best thing. It's not the best situation, but it's better than switching off the system completely. Now, we don't really have to get rid of all the processes. If we have five of them in a circular weight, why don't we just pick one of them and terminate it? And when it's terminated, the resources it has, it will give them to the next process. So the next other four processes can finish. So that's the next best thing, is to pick one process and terminate it. And there's nothing less than that. We can't do any less than that. So in order to get out of a deadlock, you know, and usually it, it's not as easy to go and buy another printer and plug it in. We need something that's be done in, you know, in a few seconds or minutes. You can't just say, oh, wait till we buy another printer or scanner and install it in the system and add it. If we do have it, that's great, switch it on, but we don't have it. So the, the point is, is that we, the only way to remove, recover from a deadlock is by terminating processes. You can start by terminating the entire system, which is big waste, or terminating the processes that are involved in a deadlock, but that also can be costly. And finally, by terminating one process. Now, the only choice we have is which process that we can select as a victim process. Like we have five of them, are we gonna kill one of them? Which one should we kill? You pick the one that will minimize the cost so for example one of them just plays music well terminate that one maybe and if we can run it again nothing will happen no damage or one that just you know i don't know displays pictures on the screen maybe there aren't most programs will be have something to do but maybe a process that goes and inquires and display a report on the screen. So we can run it later. We get a report onto the screen. It will be more even more up to date one. If it runs five minutes later, it will be a more up to date report. So that's not bad. So if the processes are reading information, well, they are okay, okay to terminate. There'll be no extra damage. They're not gonna write and save wrong information onto a file. Like the one that I, we said earlier on, you're doing something. Let's say you said, do the calculate the pay slip and you are printing all the pay slips and putting the tax and all that on all stuff. You got terminated, you have to start again, you start updating again. It can cause a lot of mistakes. Like 
total accumulative pay and accumulative tax, you might have doubling that if you run it twice. So in general, guys, don't terminate. Don't pick a process that writes information to files. Don't ever terminate those. Terminate the ones that read from file so you can read later again. But if that process is writing to a file, don't terminate it. Avoid terminating it because it, it can only cause a problem. Also, there are processes. Remember, if you ever, for example, you are downloading a file, let's say you are downloading a video or an application, and it takes a long time, the file is so big, and then you lost the internet, it probably happened to you a few times. If the internet is gone, the link is gone, then you wait again, and maybe if the internet is back, you run the same application, you start downloading the same video again. Let's say it takes 20 minutes to download or an hour, whatever it is. The line is so slow, it takes an hour. But after 55 minutes, it's finished. You, got the, you lost the line. When you start again, does this kind of application start from the beginning again? If it is, if the, that's a bad programmer. If you ever write a program like that, guys, that downloads something for a long time, try to keep a log write something say okay we downloaded 10 percent 12 15 percent 100 98 percent and if the line cuts off and you run again you check did we download this file before yeah the last time we downloaded it we are 98 percent so you talk to your other program and say go to point 98 start transmitting from that point so it depends on the programmer who've done it some programs they keep a log of how much down you know the data they're bringing in or how much of the job they're doing like if you are updating records of files for customers and you're giving them more money or whatever calculating the pay keep a log we've done record number one we finished record two three seventeen thousand four hundred and if it runs out stops and rerun again you check did, did we have a previous run? Yeah. Did we finish it? No. How far did we go? We went to record number 4,251. Then that's where you start and you continue. That's the kind of programming that if you are a programmer, try to have those kind of programs. So if your program terminates halfway through, it, it can continue from where it left off. And you can only do it if there is a log, if you can keep a log. So that's deadlock. There's a difference between a deadlock and starvation. Starvation, if you don't get the resource for a long time, very long time, but you still will get it. A deadlock, you'll never get it. In a deadlock situation, you'll never be out of that deadlock situation. This one is just an, an idea. Again, one of the scientists wrote it and he went down to China or somewhere in the Far East, and he found that those monks, they sit in a mountain somewhere, in a retreat and a place where they only think and meditate and eat. That's all they do. They sit down at a table. Every time they feel hungry, they reach and they eat. Otherwise, they sit and... And out there, in order to eat, mostly they eat rice. Like all these things are just samples, so don't, you know, it means nothing good or bad. It's just these people, they're thinkers, and as they sit and they think, they close their eyes, they think every now and again they feel hungry. Of course, they have to eat, and they eat a lot of rice, and to eat the rice, they, they have those two tools, two sticks, that they need those two tools in order to eat. And guess what? They share those tools. They are not mutually exclusive maybe health wise it's not the best idea but it's okay they're quite healthy and um, they can share these with them they actually disinfect them before they reuse them but there and there's lack of those resources they don't have a pair of what do you call them yeah the chopsticks 
they, so they share them. There's one chopstick with every, between every two of those monks. Now, some of them started getting starved. They never got a chance to eat. You know why? Because they go close their eyes and meditate for a while, and then they feel hungry. So the monk goes for those two sticks, pull them, and start eating. When they're eating, this guy cannot eat, because this guy says, I want to eat, but then that chopstick is gone. And also that one cannot eat, until this guy finishes. it. So in the meantime, they might go back and say, all right, I'll meditate, go sleep for a little while, and I'll eat later. So this guy releases. And this guy is still meditating, but still a little bit hungry. So he decides, okay, I'm gonna eat after a little while. But just before he starts eating, this guy decides, I'm gonna eat. So this guy picks up the two chopsticks. So when this guy opens the knife, he finds the right chopsticks, but the left one is gone. All right, and this is this his or her turn. So I might say, okay, I'll eat later. I go back to meditating. So they go back meditating, this guy finishes, put them there, and this guy might start eating again. So they found that sometimes they have a situation called starvation. And sometimes they have a situation of a deadlock. How could they have a deadlock? Anybody can see a situation or a scenario where these guys can have a deadlock? The all four conditions are probably available, maybe. The resources are mutually exclusive. That means, even though they can share them, but not simultaneously, at any given time, this chopstick can only be used by one monk, not two. So it's mutually exclusive. That's the first condition. Second condition, if a monk has this chopstick, this guy is eaten, this guy cannot taken away from them. So no preemption. What's the next condition? Resource holding. So if this guy decides he wants to eat, but this guy was eating, this guy picks the chopstick and holds on to it, waiting for this to finish. But when this guy looks to eat, he finds, oh, the chopstick is gone. So even if this guy is not eating, still holding that chopstick. What's the last condition? Circular weight. How could we have a circular weight here? Anybody can see any scenario where we have a circular weight? Each of them holds one of the chopsticks on one side, and one of them will be waiting for the other one. Exactly. If this guy, for example, has on the right hand side the chopstick, picked it up and looked to the left, but this guy has already picked the right hand side. So each one of them decide, they all decide to eat. They're all going to eat at the same time. So everybody go right hand side, pick the chopstick. So everybody pick the chopstick on the right hand side. Now each one of them want to go to the left, but the chopstick is gone because the guy has decided he must take it. So each one of them has one resource and is waiting for the other resource. This guy has this one on the right and is waiting for the left. That's already with this guy on the right and waiting for the left. And they're all kind of in a circular weight, basically. So they're all, each one of them is waiting on the other. And none of them will come out of it because there is no releasing. So how would you, what would you tell them guys let me give you a suggestion so you won't starve or you won't die. Because if it's a deadlock, that's it, they, they'll die. They never eat. Starvation is they might, they might starve for a long time, but then eventually they will get to eat. What would you tell them? Any suggestions? How would you tell them? Follow this rule. And you give them a rule and you leave them alone and they will not die or starve. Anybody can think of any advice? You have to eat in order. You have to eat in an order. Yeah, you can say, guys, you know, don't just eat whenever you feel hungry. Hey, you eat first, and then you, and then you, or maybe something like that. Yeah, it's possible. Though they might say, no, guys, we, we can only eat whenever we feel hungry. But yeah, thank you. That's a good idea. If you impose an order onto them, what kind of an order? 
to, to eat, you know, instead of just one eating at any one time, maybe you can allow two to eat at any given time or three. So, if, for example, you can say, for example, this is number one, two, three, four, five, you might say, this is one, three, and five you can eat. No, one and five cannot eat. Maybe. Okay, any other suggestions? Think of the five conditions you want to get rid of. What about the, um, if somebody has this chopstick and looking for the other one, the other one is not available, sits and wait for it. Any suggestions here? Don't wait for it, give the other one to the, give the other one as well, if you're ready. Yeah, okay, you might say, listen, if you, if you pick one and you look for the other and it's not there and wait for it, don't hold on to this one, release it. Don't hold and wait. That's one of the conditions required for a deadlock. Get rid of that one, for example. That's an easier one to, to implement here. You can also say, well, listen, if you are maybe, you number them, maybe one, two, three, four. If you're number one, pick the right one first. If you're an even number, if you're an odd number or an even number, pick the left one first so they don't. Or, in the, you know, instead of saying everybody you have to go for the right hand side one because you have to put an order, but um, because it's a circle, it doesn't fully work unless if you say, well, listen, if you're number one, three, or five, if you're an odd number, pick the right one first. If you're an even number, pick the left first. So they both have to pick the same stick. Whoever picks it first will continue. Otherwise, they won't touch the one, the, the one on the other side. Maybe. Okay. Just I want you to have a look at it and maybe try and maybe find it out in Google, you know, if there's, if you can find any solutions or many advice that will solve this problem, think of it. Okay, so let me ask you a couple of questions and then we can go home. How do we avoid that? Okay, anybody deadlock? How do I avoid deadlock? By losing bank assign, go to the 